Hey, West Side, Dan Sutherland here, introducing somebody who, to tell you the truth, doesn't need a lot of introduction. Jimmy Nicholson has been our worship leader out at Speedway for some time, but you're going to hear today, he's a lot more than just a great guitar player, phenomenal singer, and a pretty face. He's going to be talking to us in the last teaching in our series, Life Apps. Jimmy rocks. You're going to love his heart and love his truth. The nice part of this series is been reminding us all that following Christ, while it is not easy, it is fairly simple if you stick to the applications of God's Word. I'll be back next week and loaded and ready to go. God bless. Hello, oh, West Side. Good to see everybody. Hey, I wanted to say a shout out to everybody who's online, the on-campus, the small screen. It's awesome that we have so many people watching us. All the way around the country, we know I've got people today watching us in Connecticut and uh, some people in Texas, and I know there's people all around. I just wanted to say some super shout-outs today. We always do a shout-out. Super shout-outs. The first one is to the guys, my brothers in blue, up at Lansing Prison. Uh, I just really enjoyed worshiping with you guys last week. It was awesome. I know you guys get together every week and you worship on the third floor of an old building that's just inadequate air conditioning, and you guys are there all summer long sweating and worshiping, and it was great to be with you. So I just wanted to say hi. Glad that you were with us. My second super shout-out of the day goes to the Speedway, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of the Speedway. Been up there for about four years and uh, happy to be a part of that. You know, we have the best volunteers up at the Speedway. Nothing against the volunteers that are here. We have the best volunteers up at the Speedway. They are heart deep into the mission of Westside Family Church, which is loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus. And I just love being on that team. I am really blessed to be with them and to worship them with them on Sunday morning. So here's my invitation. If you've never been to the Speedway, don't all go at once. But you are, as always, welcome to come and worship with us on Sunday morning. And uh, I want you to know we have leather seats, very big, very comfortable, and huge cup holders, okay? So if any of you guys are the big coffee drinkers in the morning, I want you to just come on up there and feel comfortable and feel welcome anytime you want to. Hey, grab your notes. I think you got them when you walked in the door today. They're in your bulletin. Take the bulletin, open it up. The notes are inside. We're wrapping up a series today entitled Life Apps. And the big idea for the series is that God offers the wisdom that we need. He wants us to download it. He wants us to use it. Today's app is Humble Pie. And I want to unpack that for you. The concept itself has something to do with a French word called nomble. Can you say it with me? Nomble. Now you got to say it like the French do. Nomble. Nomble. Very good. See, if you learn nothing else today, you've got a little French to take home with you. It was worth coming. It refers to a pastry that is stuffed with entrails and the internal organs of butchered animals. Good stuff? Basically hot dogs, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I just ruined your favorite food for you, didn't I? I just, I, the humble pie is something we already know. I just wanted to unpack that for you a little bit, but I want to tell you a story. Today's subject is humility, and it's a tough subject. And so I want to unpack it, and I want to get personal with you with my own story. A long time ago, I had a dream. I wanted to start my own business. I imagine there's a few of you here that have had that dream. The reasons I wanted to start my own business were probably like yours. I wanted to set my own hours. I wanted to work when I wanted to work, sleep when I wanted to sleep, take a vacation when I wanted to take a vacation, and I wouldn't have anybody be my boss. You guys are laughing. You know what I'm talking about right here, right? So I decided to be a plumber. That's a great way to go for the gold, isn't it? Some of you see the problem with this right away. No, I was a plumber, and I got a business card that said I'm a plumber, and I started handing them out to my friends and people I knew, people I didn't know, and pretty soon somebody called me, and pretty soon somebody who knew somebody called somebody who knew somebody, and pretty soon the whole thing goes around and I have a little network, right? I'm building a little business, and that business is starting to be profitable slightly because I was delivering pizzas in the evening, which kind of adds. The tips are good. And uh, back then, gas didn't cost so much, so this was possible. And uh, I'm out there trying to do this business, and pretty soon it gets profitable. And the next step is I had to have an employee. And I had to get an employee. That meant I had to have insurance, and I had to have a truck, and I had to have more materials, and I needed more tools. Pretty soon I needed a little warehouse space. I needed to have a little office in the warehouse space, and I needed to have more phones. And you see the costs are starting to pile up, and the things that I have to do are starting to pile up, and this thing is becoming a little less fun than it used to be, right? Plumbing was fun in itself, all by itself. 
Well, I sat down at one point because the thing was starting to take off, and I sat around the table with three men that I really respect, my brother-in-law, my brother, and my dad, and we said, we're going to dream big. We're going to get this thing a little bit more weight, and we're going to dream this thing a little bit bigger. So we sat around, and they began to tell me what kind of things I would need to get the business going. They talked to me about systems, and they talked to me about finances and uh, financial projections, which require math, which I don't like. And they told me what I needed to do to get this thing going. And here's what it came to. In the end of it, in the consensus after the whole thing, they said, well, Jimmy, you need a business plan. I'd heard of business plans, and I had avoided them like the plague. If you could have put one thing on my plate that I would have rejected more, it would have been the business plan. For my whole life, for some reason, planning just gives me the willies. I break out in hives whenever there's planning necessary. Whenever there's me sitting down in front of a sheet of paper and going through the steps that are necessary to get something done and making a projection and doing that hard work, for some reason that just didn't click with me. It was very, very difficult. So I just said, okay, I need to do that, and I'll get it done later or later. I went for bigger sales, thinking that more money coming into the business will take care of the money that's going out of the business, right? It was more fun to go get more sales than it was to do the hard work of doing the business planning. So the thing grew, and it got a bit overwhelming, and I remember the day that I had my first big contract. I signed a piece of paper that would have made me a gross profit for my business of a million dollars. Anybody who starts their own business says, hey, that's a brass wing ring worth grabbing for. And uh, I remember celebrating in the truck all the way home by myself. It's like a million dollars. Unbelievable. I know it's gross profit, but hey, it's a million dollars, and I've never been able to say that before. And I was all excited about it, and in the back of my mind, there's this little conversation I'm remembering with my brother. My brother said, make sure you can fulfill the promises that you're making. And I thought, okay, well, I, I don't think I can do that right now. I, I don't know how to do it, right? But there's got to be a way. Business guys just go for it. They just go out there, they make the sale, and they figure out how to do it. Okay, I'll just be that guy. <laughs> I found myself at 3 o'clock in the morning soldering copper pipes together in the basement. And I realized my employees were home. My employees were sleeping. My employees were supposed to be doing this work. And I had to work longer and longer hours, and I was working constantly. And I wasn't sleeping very much, three or four hours a night, because I had to go to bed late, get up early to make sure that everybody else was taken care of, and take care of that business. So I was wearing myself out, and wearing myself out wore everyone else around me out. My relationship with my wife was stretched thin and stretched to its breaking point. My relationship with my children was kind of there and not there. I was headed for a train wreck. My relationship with everybody around me that I had built some relationship with was on its edge, and I was tearing it apart. I was the problem. I was the one that was cracking under all this pressure. Here's the end of the story. I cracked. It was crushed. End of story. End of dream. Now, there's more. I want to tell you how it ended, but I'm going to save that good part for the last, all right? That's what we do. I want you to keep a little tension there. I want you to be thinking about that because I have a lot to say, and God has a lot to say. And I want you guys to check this out. Today's message is based on a passage from James 4. We've been in the book of James this entire series. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Today's big idea, and you have some blanks for this in your notes for those of you that like to take notes. God's plan A is humility. God's plan B is humiliation. <laughs> Choose plan A. First, we're going to look at plan B. We're going to look at God's perspective. God loves you enough to oppose you. This is God's perspective. He loves you enough to oppose you. And here's what he says in Proverbs 8, 13, the second part of the verse. I hate pride. I hate arrogance. Evil behavior and perverse speech. He just lays it right out there. Plain, simple unmissable. And I've got to say, I had to own all of those things. At this point, if you heard, as you heard in my story, I had stretched everybody around me. And that was my attitude. I was prideful. I was arrogant. I was full of evil behavior and perverse speech. Nothing was uplifting. As we heard Jason say last week, we needed to flip our talk around so we're not always critical and condemning, but encouraging and uplifting. It wasn't any of those things. This verse applies to me. This verse applied to me. I have learned a few things since then. And we'll lay that out for you. Let's check Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26, verse 19. God says, 
I will break down your stubborn pride, make the sky above you like iron, and make earth beneath you like bronze. And maybe that needs a little unpacking for you. So let's put it this way. God opposes your work. He will oppose your work and dry up your resources in order to get your attention. He will oppose your work and dry up your resources in order to get your attention. If you're driving down the road of life and you're going fast, a lot of times we miss things. And the Humble Pie app is that little bell that you hear in the back of your head slightly and dimly dinging, ding, 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 ding. As things are going on around you that you might be missing, there's a little warning sign. The Humble Pie app is that idiot light on your dashboard that doesn't tell you much, but it tells you there's danger. You need to stop. You need to slow down. If you're driving down the road of life and you see that little light come on, God's trying to get your attention. He's saying, stop, slow down, pay attention to the road signs because the road signs are telling you there's danger up ahead of you and you're missing it. You're going too fast. What might this look like in your life? Maybe you have fewer friends than you used to have. Maybe the friends that you have remaining are telling you you're drinking too much. Maybe your spouse is saying you're never home. And when you are home, you're nothing but argumentative. You just beat us down with your words. Maybe you're not sleeping enough because you can't sleep. Maybe your character is changing. The things that you used to find easy to stick to, and you were almost proud of them, this is what I don't do in life, whatever. You know, you're finding yourself compromising on those things or considering crossing the line. You feel like God is judging you. If these are the things you're experiencing, that's humble pie coming your way. That's the little thing God's put in all of us that tells us, hey, slow down. There's trouble ahead. I want to save you. Pay attention. Here's what God is asking you to do. Get back to the basics. Luke 14. In your notes, you can see it. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. God is asking us to get back to the basics. I had to own all those behaviors in my life, uh, all those scriptures we read. They applied to me. I'm not just talking to you or at you. I'm saying this applied to me. And so from personal experience, I want you to know that God wants you to get back to the basics and number two, win through daily humble choices. Here's where we get into choosing plan A. Let's look at Luke 14. A parable that Jesus gives us that talks about the daily choices. Back to the basics. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Now, this isn't in your notes, but write this in for me. Choose the cheap seats. I know you have your eye on the box seats. God knows you have your eye on the box seats in the brass ring. He says, choose the cheap seats. Daily humble choices. Let's check Philippians 2. More wisdom from God. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I want to tell you what this looked like for me. Out of all the things that were going wrong in my life, one of the things the most important to me was my relationship with my wife, and it was stretched to its breaking point. I was blessed to get some counsel here from Dick Deerwester in our counseling department, and uh, he said, Jimmy, here's what you need to do. You need to pay attention to the little things. Get back to the basics. He said, you need to pay attention to the things that your wife likes and the things that your wife doesn't like. So I want to tell you, I have a list Next to my bed, it's a little piece of paper in a manila folder, and that piece of paper has a list of 30 or so items that my wife does not like, okay? For example, when I get in her car and I'm going to take it somewhere, even if I'm on an errand for her, I have to put the radio station back where I found it. <laughs> I have to put the seat back where I found it. 
She's a little bit shorter than I am. She doesn't like to have to move the thing. I have to put the mirror back where I found it, right? Isn't this easy? Shouldn't she be able to do these things by herself? Of course she should, right? That's not the point. The point is she doesn't like it when I leave them in my settings. It's her car. She drives it way more than I do, and this is what she wanted. So Dick reminded me, Jimmy, you have to get back to the basics and pay attention to the little things that are important to your wife. Now, I have a list of things that she does like and those things she gets on her birthday. I want you to know that I have permission to share those things that she doesn't like. I have permission to share those things. There are more. <laughs> For West Side, here's an example of some, somebody who has been doing this and been listening to the thing and getting back to the basics, right, and listening to God talking to them. I know there's a family at the Speedway who heard God telling them to do something with their life and they, they knew it was something. They began to pursue it. They asked God, what are you doing in our lives? And he said, oh, I want you to move. So through a series of small steps and prayerful decisions, they sold their home. Then they heard God tell them to move to Kansas City, Kansas. He said, you're going to have an impact down there. They didn't know where yet. So they went down there and they asked God, where are we supposed to go? He led them to a great neighborhood. He led them to a great house. It was a great, it's a great story, and I'm sure you'll hear it sometime. But the point is they took a whole bunch of little steps of obedience along the way, and God moved them from where they were, Johnson County, all the way down to Kansas City, Kansas, so they could have a bigger impact. And right now they're impacting hundreds of people by living their lives on fire for Jesus. Lots of little steps added up to something big and a huge impact that's just growing all the time. I know a story of another guy... <clears throat> who's a firefighter, and uh, he has to deal with things that are beyond most of us, right? Very heroic efforts are necessary to be a firefighter, to say nothing of what the family has to go through to sacrifice for the firefighter's schedule. Um, he said that there are people out there who take advantage of the system. I mean, he goes out and he lays his life on the line for people out there who are genuinely in trouble, and then there's people who take advantage of the system. They know that they can call and fake an injury and get the ambulance to come out, and then they have to take them to the hospital. And these people are just abusing the system, and it makes them angry at times. But this same guy saw a homeless guy who hangs around the firehouse, who does this kind of stuff on purpose, out there on a hot day, and took him a cup of cold water. Small things. Daily, humble choices. This is the kind of stuff that God's looking for us to do. Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. That's it right there. That's the basics. And this is what God asks us to do. He asks us to humbly obey this. But here's the thing. He does not guarantee a result that we're going to like. He does not guarantee that because you go out and serve somebody that they're going to love you back or serve you back or repay you with anything that looks anything like what you want. No guarantee. You cannot trust in your own efforts. I cannot trust in my own efforts, even my own efforts to do the little things that my wife likes or doesn't like. I cannot guarantee or expect that that response is going to come back to me and I'll feel fulfilled because I did what God asked me to do. He asked me to do it anyway. He knows that we need to see something that we can't see. All right? We need to trust him. You need to trust him to lift you up. Trust God to do the lifting. Isaiah 66, 2. Let's look at God's eyes for us. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and broken in spirit and who tremble at my word. Contrite means broken, workable, teachable. We first talked about God loving us enough to oppose us, that there's that humble pie app dinging in the back of our head that God uses to slow us down, if we'll pay attention, to save us from a train wreck that could be coming. He'll stop us in our tracks. He'll bring a boulder down out of the heavenly sky and crash our little car on the road of life in order to stop us from what's ahead of us. He loves us that much. He wants us to win through daily humble choices. He wants us to go after him in that way. And thirdly, he wants us to trust him to do the lifting. Now, let me take you back to the end of the story. I told you about my business. I told you I just couldn't keep it going myself. I told you it crashed. I told you it died. That was the end of my dream. I was talking to an attorney about the whole thing, and he said, you've got to file bankruptcy. There's no way out of this. So I did. 
that meant that I had to humble myself in front of my wife and be a failure in front of my wife and my kids and everybody else who knew me. But I had to sit around the table in front of a bankruptcy judge. And the, and the judge in that moment, it was a scary moment, right? I was already humbled uh, to some degree. <laughs> To some degree, anyway, he got all the paperwork out there. He spread it in front of me and said, sign here. I did. He said, okay, everything's cleared. You're done. You can keep your truck so that you can make a little work for your family. You can make some income for your family. And then he said, one more thing. I'll be seeing you again. I know your type. Boom. Something hit me that shattered this kind of crustiness around my heart. And I realized, whoa. Whoa. He can see my motivations. He can see I'm not all together. He can see I need help. And he called me on it. I did not like that judge. <laughs> I did not like that judge. But here's what I want you to know. There is another judge, and his name is Jesus. And he knows your type. What is your type? Your type is the same as my type. I'm not telling you anything that doesn't apply to me. My type wants honor. I want to be honored. My type wants to be respected. I want to be respected. I want praise, and I want praise from the praiseworthy. I want someone who is, in my view, honorable to honor me. I look to that person. You know what? That's not wrong. That's the way we're built. We are all built to need praise and to honor, and we're all built to be lifted up and to need that. We all need love, and we need to be held, and we need to be validated and all that. It's all good stuff. We've got to look in the right direction. We cannot lift ourselves up. We've got to trust God to do the lifting. <clears throat> Let's look at this. Philippians 2. And in that awesome worship set as we were singing, Troy read this for us. Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And just that first part there that says, and being found in appearance as a man, what does that mean? It means Christ, God, the Son of God, lowered himself to be with us. We are his creation and his idea, but we're stinky. How do you tell a good shepherd from a bad shepherd? He smells like his sheep. And Christ calls himself the good shepherd. He leads us to good things. He leads us to food. He leads us to water. And when we're sick, he gets down there in among us and he checks out our illnesses. And when we need to be treated, he gets down in us like a shepherd would and treats the sheep. And in the process, he gets us all over him. He got stinky for us. He came down on this earth and endured the shame of the cross. But before that, he walked in humility with us among crazy people, among stupid people, among the lepers. And he touched the lepers, not only touched the lepers, he healed the lepers. He crossed all the culture, cultural barriers and boundaries that are out there that were separating people from God. And by example, brought himself low the lowest of the low, endured the cross so that he could be lifted up the highest. And the reason he was lifted up the highest is to give us hope. Because he was lifted up the highest, he will lift us up in the end. That's the game. That's the goal. That's what he has in mind for us. That's what he wants us to search after and trust him for. What would it look like if we trusted God to do the lifting in our lives, with our, in our relationship with him, what would it look like if we trusted God to do the lifting in our families, in our business relationships, in our workplaces? What would it look like in our communities? What would it look like in our church, a West Side Family Church, if we trusted God to do the lifting? Not ourselves, but Him. What would it look like in our city? What would happen in our nation? What would happen in our world? God's plan for us is humility. That's plan A. God's plan B is humiliation. Choose plan A. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are glorious. And I thank you for the worship that we had this morning. Just beautiful. God, thank you for pouring into our lives already. I just pray that in the process of examining things that may be very heavy and very present and very now, 
in people's lives, God, that you pour out your blessing and your spirit and let everyone know that you are the hope that we have. You are who we look to to be lifted up. No matter what problem we're going through right now, there is hope, and it's in you. I pray that our hearts are turned toward you, God. I pray that our eyes are turned toward you and that we look to you for all these things, that we trust in you with all of our heart, that we give ourselves to you trusting that you have our best interest in mind. Even if you are opposing what our dream is, you have a better one for us. Jesus, we love you. We pray to you and in your perfect name. Amen. Thanks for coming, Westside. See you next week.